This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The reports that came across were not good reports. So killings of people, destruction of property, and over a thousand people had lost their lives. I had a, a brainstorm, and Kofi Annan's name came into my head. Next thing I knew, I was reading headlines, I was trading oil with Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and I'd never been to Iraq, I'd never met Saddam Hussein. And the media went to project that, uh, the facade in which Kofi's disappointed in, when he stepped down, it wasn't that he had a very peaceful life, no. And, and people also sought him out still for advice and for help. So that was why he founded the foundation. He just continued what he always had been doing. I, Kofi Annan, solemnly swear to exercise in all loyalty, discretion, and conscience the functions entrusted to me as Secretary General of the United Nations. Congratulations, sir. When Kofi became the Secretary General of the United Nations, he entered into the murky political arena of war and peace. But just before he could get a chance to settle into his new role, the Iraq crisis broke out in 1998. Even though he was heavily backed to the post by the United States, he was now receiving a backlash from them for the failure of the United Nations special mission to disarm Iraq. Events in Iraq have now reached the final days of decision, urging the dictator to leave Iraq so that disarmament can proceed peacefully. In an unprecedented move, Kofi decided to visit Iraq's embattled leader Saddam Hussein with the aim of brokering a peace deal. Bijan Furnudi is a former colleague of his. He understands how Kofi would go to great lengths to ensure peace prevailed. He reached out to all stakeholders. He spoke to everyone, which meant that sometimes he was sitting around the table with characters that you could describe as slightly unsavory. He would travel to Baghdad before the US-led invasion in, in 2003 and meet Saddam Hussein. He spent a lot of time with uh, persons that many considered to be at the root of problems. History has shown that um, his position was correct because he was against the war in Iraq purely because he didn't believe there were weapons of mass destruction and I think you know, we still haven't found them. However, his peace efforts came to naught as the United States invaded Iraq in March of 2003 with the aim of overthrowing the government of Saddam Hussein. When Kofi Annan became the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations, he entered into an organization that was trying to redeem itself from several failures of the previous administration. Six weeks after we came up with a reform plan, somebody managed to get an article into a newspaper complaining that uh, I have not reformed the UN and its agencies in six weeks flat. In the midst of this surmounting challenge, Kofi went about it with a great sense of humor. I started by apologizing for my failure to reform the UN in such a short period. And Sergei Lavrov, who is today the foreign minister of Russia and the only communist in the room, he quoted the Bible. He said, Mr. Secretary General, what are you complaining about? You've had more time than God had in creating the world. <laughs> and I said, yes, you're right. But God had a unique advantage. He worked alone. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, he hit the ground running. 
Soon after he took the oath of office, he released two reports on management reforms for his administration. He also managed to merge many departments that were redundant and quickly reduced the staff size by 1,000 personnel. Mr. Nan demanded a lot of his staff. He was a high-powered person who would not sit still. He did not know taking a break. He was constantly planning and plotting new projects, and he expected the same from his staff. And Kofi Annan world is a different world from the regular world of regular people. You interact at the highest level, the stakes are high, and all eyes are on you. And when Kofi Annan started doing like this on the table, you knew it was time to wrap up the meeting, pol politely tell the, the person that, uh, thank you very much, but Mr. Nan now has to go to his next appointment. And it was, it was, uh, it was high pace. Beyond the reforms that he had to undertake, there were crises brewing in all corners of the world, most notably the East Timor conflict. Indonesia was not willing to let East Timor have its independence, but Kofi convinced the government of Suharto to allow for a referendum for the people of East Timor to decide. They voted for independence and all hell broke loose. East Timor, and that uh, he was very involved with that, uh, by how to resolve that issue, and that meant also receiving calls during the night and, uh, and uh, working through the day. Because he was so involved with his work, I would also be driving the car to not to, if we were going out somewhere. But Kofi would bring the government of Indonesia around, and a new country was born. The Nobel Peace Committee took note of this and other endeavors in Kosovo and Yemen. Kofi's Nobel Peace Prize came at the height of his successful diplomatic career. Peace must be sought above all because it is the condition for every member of the human family to live a life of dignity and security. It was actually my parents who then called from Sweden saying, wow, you got the Nobel Peace Prize, that is so wonderful. You know, he was always a very modest person, a very humble person, but I think in this particular case, he was so delighted both for the United Nations and what it stands for, and also, of course, very happy for himself. Being born among the Ashanti people, his cultural roots and the Ashanti outlook in life could have played a big part in shaping his leadership skills. Our tradition was founded on democratic practice. We were raised on, on uh, principles like rule of law, respect for human rights, uh, freedom of thought and expression and of association. So Kofi becoming an international civil servant at the United Nations and his liberalism continued with him, looked globally at things, always talking of uh, respect for human rights, tolerance, that was our tradition. Just before the height of the Iraq war, Kofi was given the title of Busumuru by King Osei Tutu II, the current Ashanti king. The king had the highest of respect for Kofi Annan. You know, that's why he decided to confer on him the title of Busumu, which means son of the golden stone. And he's the first and only person that has been given that honor since the Ashanti Empire came into being in the 17th century. So I think that in a nutshell speaks a lot about the high regard he had for Kofiana. His deep roots in Africa were incredibly important for him. I mean, his identity was never uncertain. The Busumuru title, I think it was um, awarded to him for the selfless, his selfless contribution to world peace. So it fits in beautifully with what he actually was uh, doing on the global stage. But Kofi's last reform push was to bring in the civil society into the UN. 
a move that was controversial, but one that he stubbornly pushed until it was embedded in the system. As Secretary General, I, I opened up the organization to bring in the uh, private sector as well as civil society. I did it for several reasons, that the world was changing and the voice of the people and the civil society was important. But the other reason was the UN has such a huge mandate, we had a lot of things to do that we could not do alone. The civil society sector, as well as the private sector, you strengthen society. Although he was globally accepted by many for his missions to foster peace and reconciliation, Kofi could not escape the negative scrutiny from his peers within the United Nations. His credibility came under scrutiny in 2004 when a report surfaced that his son Kojo had directly benefited from a UN project known as the UN Oil for Food Program. This allegation was later to be declared false and vindicated both Kofi and his son. Certain other countries and parties had their own agenda and of course my father's integrity is absolute so they wouldn't be able to find any blemish on him and when they'd searched, searched, they couldn't find it, they thought, oh, where can we find a weak link? And they now thought, oh, he has a son doing business in Africa and then next thing I knew I was reading headlines that I had an oil trading company in Nigeria. I was reading headlines that I was trading oil with Saddam Hussein in Iraq and I'd never been to Iraq, I'd never met Saddam Hussein. Many years later I sued the Sunday Times and won a libel case. But of course during that whole, the eye of the storm for want of a better word, of course, of course, sensitivities between my father and I, and then the media went to project that uh, the son in which Kofi's disappointed in, that was the, the, the bridge that, that they tried to break, but you know, the, the family bond is always gonna, gonna be stronger. And really it was just a speed bump in the scheme of life. After an illustrious career at the United Nations that spanned over five decades in 2006, Kofi gave the world his farewell speech as the organization's Secretary General. Dear friends and colleagues, saying goodbye is never easy. I have spent most of my life working with the United Nations. I feel it is my home. I can think of no other job in the world that would have been so rewarding. Without your support, I could not have achieved what I did or got through some very difficult times. I will count on you to carry on your indispensable work and I wish you all success in the years ahead. When, when I stepped down as Secretary General, both Nan and I, my wife were both very tired so we decided we, we were going to take a rest. So we borrowed a friend's house in the Como region in Italy. It was adjacent to a forest, and so we can walk into the forest, get some exercise without exposing ourselves, because we wanted really to be incognito. So we said no radio, no television, no newspapers. And I was determined to do this for three months. But after six weeks, I was getting bored, and I said, let's go and get, get a newspaper. So we walked into a shop, and within minutes, a group of men at the corners stared at us, and one broke away and made for us. We have six weeks to go, and we've broken our cover. How are we going to manage the village? By then, the fellow was on top of me, and he put his hand out, said, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> May I have an autograph? So I said, sure. <laughs> Kofi, however, did not stop his peacemongering missions. In 2007, he founded the Kofi Annan Foundation. 
an independent, not-for-profit organization that he would use to promote better global governance and peace. He set up his office in Geneva, the city where he launched his career. And so when he stepped down, it wasn't that he had a very peaceful life, no. And, and people also sought him out still for advice and for help. So that was why he founded the foundation, the Kofi Annan Foundation, where he could garner the political will and um, he just continued what he always had been doing. When he left the United Nations, Mr. Allen came to Switzerland. Being someone who was not going to retire and play golf, um, he retired from retirement, as he often said, and then set up the foundation in his own name as a means to carry on his work. There's still no end in sight to the political violence in Kenya, which has claimed the lives of nearly 900 people. The silence echoes in Nairobi as supporters of President Mwai Kabaki and opposition candidate Raila Odinga try to settle on the street what they could not decide at the ballot box. What will it take to bring calm to Kenya? Kofi Annan's first major job under his foundation would come in 2008 when the East African country of Kenya erupted into civil strife after contested election results were announced. Former Ghanaian President John Kufour was the first mediator to be sent to the country since he was the sitting head of the Africa Union. The reports that came across were not good reports. So killings of people, destruction of property, and within a short space of time, over a thousand people had lost their life. As head of the African Union, I felt a duty to come to Nairobi to plead with the two sides, only to find that there was a, a irreconcilable situation between the government and the opposition. I had only a very limited time. I think after the second day, since the time was running out for me, I had a, a brainstorm and Kofi Annan's name came into my head. The spotlight then shifted to Kofi Annan, who was called to come and mediate the conflict. There should be a dialogue under the auspices of uh, eminent Africans. President Kibaki readily accepted the name Kofi Annan. So I rushed to Intercontinental to meet with Raila and Co. And they said, with that, we might talk. Leading a team of eminent African personalities, Kofi Annan firmly declared that his work will be to reach a peaceful solution in the shortest time possible. Nana Efa Apenteng worked hand in hand with Kofi Annan during the mediation talks, and behind the scenes, he was Kofi's go to man for any advice. When the Kenyan crisis uh, occurred, President Kufo called me and told me that I should get ready to go to Kenya. And I said, What for? He said, Kofi Annan had called that he needed me to come and assist him. That's how I ended up in Kenya. And on arrival, I knew I was going to be there for only about two weeks. Unfortunately, I ended up staying there for six years. I think from the outset, we saw him as uh, impartial. He commanded respect because of the international role he had played. So we had confidence that they will, without being partisan, be able to bring us together. And the first thing the late Kofi Annan did when he arrived was to put the negotiating teams from both sides in a room and he requested us to shake each other's hands. I personally found it almost offensive, but didn't say so. And we went ahead, reluctantly in my heart, you offer a limp hand, and we shook hands around. And that diffused the tension and the awkwardness. And then now he briefed us how he hoped us to proceed. I think it is important that we do all we can, not only to end the violence, 
bring peace and stability here, but also look at the root causes of the problem. You're all Kenyans. There's only one Kenya. And we should think about our common humanity and what unites us rather than what divides us. Over the course of 41 days, Kofi was able to broker several peace deals that led to the two warring leaders signing the peace accord. That agreement was signed on the steps of uh, Baharambi House and the whole country, everybody was watching. And uh, I think that uh, the euphoria in Kenya at that time, I, I, I mean, it went beyond my imagination. This agreement signaled the birth of a coalition government in Kenya. Kofi again would be thrust into the world of mediation talks during the Syrian crisis that started in 2011. He would be appointed as the UN Arab League envoy in Syria in an attempt to broker a peace deal between the fighting factions. Before I took it on, I told the council that this is almost an impossible job, but I think we can make a difference if you, we have the support and you, the council, stay united. They did at the beginning, but the divisions uh, re-emerged. However, Kofi failed in his peace mission for peace in Syria to what he attributed to as a lack of political will by the Syrian leaders. Kofi would continue to hold talks and seminars on issues of peace and governance. Among many of such talks, he held governance discussions at the McAllister College and the Blavatnik School of Governance. You have to assert your relevance and your influence and engage. The doors cannot close. In the morning of August the 18th, 2018, the world woke up to the news that Kofi Atta Annan had passed on after a short illness in Switzerland. I was in London when my sister sent me a message from, from Mrs. Annan. He is critically ill, so we should pray. Early morning, I, had a, I saw Kujo's WhatsApp, contact Amma. Then I started crying. I started screaming, I said, no, my uncle is dead. When I called him, I was crying. I says, I shouldn't cry. He's led a good life. We should remember what his past and we should focus and his past. Oh, yeah. It was a very, very dark day for us. Alice Adekwehi had sensed that Kofi Atta Anan was no more. The morning that Ankofi died, yeah, mom had called Maud that, why is it that Ankofi is here sitting alone where uh, they are all not with him? And then we brought her to the dining hall to come and eat too. When she was eating, she said, ah, why is the Kofi alone is sitting down there? I said, ma, Kofi is not here. Was Kofi not now? There he is. It was indeed a great shock to hear that. And the difficulty around that time was how to break the news to the sister. It was really very difficult. Once in a while, all this time, you know, once in a while, she, you see her crying. Oh, Kofi, Kofi, I should have gone. Eh? I should have gone, then Kofi will see to everything. Kofi will bury me and Kofi, uh, if I'm not lying, every month you hear her. Kofi Ejamuho, Wakamanku, Wakamanku. Um, yeah, there are many key lessons I took from, from my dad, because whilst he was, you know, a big global statesman, he was still, to us, just a dad. And we used to argue sometimes as kids, or he, he was amazing sometimes, and sometimes he would annoy me just like anybody else's dad. But I think the key lessons I got that I would share with my children, humility, respect, integrity, 
and also just a general duty of care and empathy to other human beings. Yes, I tell people to comfort for myself and for others to know that he died peacefully and that the family, we were there for the last days and I was whispering to him how he was loved and how he was, um, how much he contributed. His life is to be celebrated. Even in death, Kofi would be hailed as a true global statesman. His funeral would be graced by friends, family, and leaders from different spheres of the globe. Kofi's passing could not have come at a worse time. His maternal side of the family are locked in a legal battle concerning the chieftaincy of the Aqua Mufie. His skills at resolving this will be greatly missed. You know, people often ask me, what was Kofi Annan like? What was he really like? And the answer is always, he was exactly what you thought he was. There were no two Kofi Annans. The Kofi Annan you know from television, from watching the evening news for 10 years when he was Secretary General, that was the only Kofi Annan there was. There was no other Kofi Annan. The way he carried himself was the same. His tone of voice, the energy uh, he exuded, the way he made you feel. Uh, was was the same and he had he had an art that was he understood very well that what you are going to remember after your meeting with him is not what you said is, is how he made you feel people remembered how he made them feel Well, he wanted the foundation to continue on, so we've done our, we'll continue to do our best to ensure the, that the momentum continues. We've had a lot of support, encouragement from around the world. Obviously, with Mr. Allen's passing, the foundation has lost its principal spokesperson, but the things he stood for remain valid, and that's what we have to focus on. Well, the spirit of the leader lives on in the foundation, and not just his spirit, but his way of doing things, the values that informed the things he did, help people living in volatile and fragile communities, in fragile societies, in fragile countries, to build lasting peace by overcoming the threats that they face. Public health threats, whether they are related to governance, to elections, you name it. That will continue to be the mission of the Kofi Annan Foundation, to build lasting peace in fragile places. Nevertheless, the legacy that Kofi had left behind still lives on beyond the grave. He believed in uh, the three pillars of society who are so interconnected that peace and security, human rights, and develop, inclusive development. His legacy, is, it has to continue. That was his life, serving mankind. For a man who strived to foster peace, proper governance and reconciliation, Kofi Atta Annan will remain in the lives of many for his role in peace brokering efforts across the globe. Rest in peace, Basumuro Kofi Atta Anan.